All right, tonight we're going to, I'm going to say we're not going to wrap up uh, this series on the book of Acts, which has been going for the past, since before the pandemic. So uh, it's, it has been a while. We're going to cover the last of the book, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at some of the key things. Uh, so we're not quite done yet, but we, this will be covering the last section of text. So that's kind of exciting if, if I didn't enjoy that and, and considering going back to Acts 1 and starting all over again. But we will read Acts chapter 28, and we'll start with verse 16, uh, and we'll just go through the rest of the, the chapter. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans." who, when they had examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Sorry, I've got to sneeze. My nose is itching really badly. And as loud as I sneeze, you don't want me anywhere near the microphone. All right, so for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither receive letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them excuse me, concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our father, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this, peace, of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and th that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Amen. Brother Lou, will you pray God's blessing on us this morning, or this afternoon, this evening, please? Amen. Thank you. Please feel free to be seated. All right, so again, thank you, buddy. I had told you a while ago that my Wednesdays for a little while were going to be a little bit more uh, ad hoc and conversational than fully prepared. So I've been trying to work off of outlines, and thank you for bearing with me on that. So we're going to just go through this kind of verse by verse, taking a look at it. So first, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. Uh, we, we covered this verse last week, but I wanted to highlight one of the facts is that the word is a soldier kept him, and the kept means to guard. Uh, many scholars believe that uh, this referred to a common practice of the time in which a prisoner was literally bound to his guard. They would have maybe not a heavy chain, but there would be a chain from his arm connecting him to the Roman guard. And so many scholars believe that Paul was not unchained, but he was 
allowed to be in his own house while attached to this, uh, by this guard. Um, so think about that, having to walk around the house, chained to some guy. You'd get to know him pretty well. Uh, there's, well, we're not going to get graphic, but think of all the times when you would like to be alone, and you can't be alone, because some guy is attached to you, you know. Hopefully it's the left, anyway. Uh, and so, he's, many scholars believe that he is spending his days chained to this guard. And then as we read that it was after three days, Paul calls the chief of the Jews together, and they all come to him, and he tells them, you know, I, even though I've committed nothing against uh, the people or the customs of our fathers, still I was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And this, of course, mirror, uh, echoes what Agabus had told him in Caesarea back in chapter uh, 21, when Agabus takes his belt and, or Paul's belt and ties his own hands up and says, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver them or deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And so Paul is deliberately echoing this phrasing, saying, I've been delivered from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And then he's, you know, he says, basically, the Romans then examined me, and they couldn't find any reason to, to put me to death, uh, and so they would have let me go. But the Jews were opposed to them releasing me, and as a result of the Jewish opposition, uh, I, was, I was forced to appeal unto Caesar. He says, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. And that's a little bit of a tricky wording. I think we're going to cover that a little, a little later, perhaps. But he, uh, the point is, Sometimes the verbs get, get confused. And so what he's saying is, you know, the, Jew, the Romans were going to let me go, which is also what we found that Caesar would have done to Jesus, right? But uh, the Jews were against it, and so I had to appeal to Caesar. And so here I am. I, I'm not accusing my nation of anything, uh, but I'm appealing this, uh, their charge against me. And so he says, For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because if for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And so, uh, thinking about this, the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. You can imagine him literally holding up his hand and shaking the chain with which he is bound to this Roman guard, right? And saying, I am here bound by this chain for the hope of Israel. And the hope of Israel, of course, is, is quite a topic in and of itself. Um, there, there are several aspects of it, but ultimately, it's the messianic expectation, right? Um, the hope of Israel uh, kind of primarily refers to the Messiah who would, or the anointed one who would deliver Israel from its oppressors, who would restore the kingdom to its, to its glory, and would in, uh, institute this, this reign of peace and justice. And, and this was a common thought at the time, and this is why even the Lord's disciples were saying, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? And the Lord, you can imagine, getting kind of irritated, well, probably not him because he was Jesus, but, you know, but saying, you're not understanding the kingdom is not of this world. Uh, and so, but for the Jewish mindset, the kingdom of God, or the kingdom that the Messiah was going to resurrect was earthly, and uh, many, many people believed that. And so the hope of Israel is this expectation of the uh, coming of the Messiah uh, has to do with the restoration, as I said, of Israel, which is, is not just uh, throwing off the yoke of Rome and reestablishing Israel as its own nation, but it includes the, res the return of all the exiles. It includes the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the renewing of that, of that covenant with God. Uh, so for Paul and for us, the hope of Israel uh, is quite literally the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the fulfillment. 
He is that Messiah who was expected. He is the one who has uh, restored Israel to just to its walk with God. He's he's the one who will institute uh, an eternity of peace and justice. Uh, so he came to bring spiritual deliverance and to establish uh, the kingdom of God. Uh, and a key component of Jesus Christ as the hope of Israel is uh, that he was resurrected from the dead. And this is something that Paul uh, mentions quite a bit because the resurrection from the dead was a key tenant of uh, the Pharisees' belief and tied in with uh, proof that he was the Messiah. And so for Paul, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was the, the first fruits of this hope, uh, which is the, the promise or the, uh, the demonstration of goodwill that the promised resurrection for us all uh, is, you know, is going to happen. Uh, and he writes at length about this in 1 Corinthians 15, I believe it is. Uh, in the next part of the hope of Israel is, hope of Israel, we see that as the hope of a people, right? Not, not a hope of the world. And so when we, when we see, see this, Paul continually went to the Jews first. And when the Jews rejected him, he went to the Gentiles. And so for him, it is the hope of Israel, but the rejected hope of Israel becomes the hope of the world. And it's not that this is a, a last minute or a last ditch uh, idea by the Lord. This has been his plan all along. The stone that the builders rejected, the same has become the, the headstone of the corner, right? So this has been the plan all along that he would present himself uh, as a redeemer to his people. Uh, they would reject him and he would uh, then become the redeemer to the world. I just accidentally typed several pages worth of the letter K. So, nope, there's an M in there as well. So we're, we're doing well. All right, and again, part of, you know, part of the, the difficulty, or at least the reality of the situation there was that Jesus Christ proclaimed himself to be the Messiah. He was clear in his teachings that he was the Messiah. And yet so many of the Jews of, of his and Paul's time did not accept him as being that hope of Israel. Uh, because, again, they were looking at a more earthly power and liberation from Roman rule rather than a guy who says uh, all of this hinges on two commandments, to love God and love others. Uh, and so Paul's whole mission is to the Jews is to explain their misunderstanding of the Messiah and that the Messiah ship has been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so for him, he's saying, you know, for the hope of Israel, I am in these chains. Uh, he is, in fact, in chains because he's been proclaiming that the hope of Israel is here and has fulfilled the promise. And so, and then, of course, we can look at his personal testimony here. Well, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. And so ultimately we see that this hope of Israel is this uh, promise of a, a king who would inaugurate yeah, a, a new era of, of restoration, redemption, and blessings, and this promise of ultimate peace. And so this hope of Israel is that the sure mercies of David come to pass and uh, refers to the Savior King. And, the, and Paul is telling them that this is the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm, I know I just said that like four different times, but it's important to understand this. Uh, and so Paul is saying the reason I'm in chains is because the hope of Israel is here. Because I'm telling people about the hope of Israel. Uh, if I were not walking around proclaiming the hope of Israel, I would not be in these chains. And so... Uh, Paul repeatedly refers to himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And, you know, to me, I kind of see these as linked. He's saying, I am in chains for the hope of Israel. 
And part of the reason uh, for this being in chains for the hope of Israel is because the chains were designed to limit him. But what they really did was they brought him to people he would not have reached had he not been in chains. He never would have talked to Felix. He never would have talked to Festus. Uh, he never would have a chance to appear before Nero if he hadn't been in chains. And so, in fact, he was in chains so that he could proclaim the hope of Israel to people he otherwise never would have come in contact with. And so then we start looking at all these times when he calls himself the prisoner of Jesus Christ. And there's two aspects of that. Like So there's Ephesians 3.1, right? For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, uh, in the next chapter, he says, therefore, or I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. And then talking to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.8, uh, he says uh, something like, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. And writing to Philemon, he says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy, our brother. And so over and over again, he, he refers to himself in this context of being a prisoner for and of Jesus Christ. And, and many scholars believe that most of his epistles and writings were done during this, these two years that he spent in Rome. I'm not going to go too deep into that. but uh, So, in fact, he was literally a prisoner. But it's not just the literal, I don't know how to say this correctly, so bear with me. His being a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ has two components to it. One is the fact that he was literally imprisoned as because he was proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ. The second was that he was fully surrendered to the Lord, that he was in full wholehearted service to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, he was in chains uh, to, you know, due to the, his attempts. But also, it's that reference of like when the Lord said, I only do what the Father gives me to do. You know, Jesus himself said, look, I've limited my, myself, and I only do what my purpose is. I only do what, what uh, God's intent is. I don't go off on my own earthly desires. I am constrained by the will of uh, he who sent me. And so looking at this, Paul is saying much the same thing. I don't get to do whatever I want to do. Remember, he wanted to go into Asia, and the Holy Ghost constrained him, right? And so repeatedly we see that Paul doesn't get to do what he wants to do because he's sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's given all of that to him so that the Lord gets to dictate to him where he goes, what he does, and who he talks to. And it's that wholehearted uh, surrender to the Lord that makes him a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we see that these chains that were meant to bind him and to restrict his ability in fact, gave him access to the, to the greatest power uh, known to earth at that time. Moving on to the next uh, verse in 21. And they said unto him, We neither receive letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, whereas concerning the sect we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So this is good news for Paul, right? Uh, where he was traveling throughout Turkey, or modern-day Turkey, uh, angry Jews had sent members of the angry Jew community to, to tell the Jewish community in the next city all the bad things about Paul and to try to get them all ramped up. And so no matter where Paul went, he had these people come along trying to convince everybody else to kill him. Paul arrives in Rome, and that's not the case. These people haven't heard anything about Paul, but they have heard about the sect uh, that he represents, the Christians. So maybe the Jerusalem Jews, remember uh, a whole bunch of them had vowed not to eat nor drink until they killed him. Maybe they starved to death at this point. You know, it's been a couple of years. It's a long time to go without drinking water. Maybe they meant that vow uh, figuratively, like everybody else means it figuratively when, when things don't work the way they expect. You know, you're healed in Jesus' name. Well, you still can't walk while your spirit's healed. You know, it's a, I meant you're in the future. And so maybe 
they didn't take that literally, but um, maybe they thought that Paul wasn't going to survive the journey, and so they didn't bother sending ahead. Maybe they just felt that if he's going to show up in front of Nero, Nero was going to kill him anyway. Maybe they just thought that he was far enough away to be out of his hair, or out of their hair. And the ironic thing here is that even if Paul hadn't gone to Rome, he would have been out of the hair of the Jews in Jerusalem because he told them, remember back in Acts 22, that the Lord had sent him out of Jerusalem to the Gentiles because the Jews had rejected him. Remember, he says, uh, the Lord appeared saying, make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And, and Paul's like, nah, Lord, they'll listen to me. I'm a, I'm a great witness. And he's like, no, they're not going to. Uh, so depart, for I'll send thee hence into the Gentiles. And that's when all the Jews surrounding him in that crowd lost their minds and started yelling, this man's not fit to live. Uh, but if they just let him go, he would have gone to the Gentiles. And they wouldn't have had to worry about him. So sometimes people... Make a whole lot of commotion when all they have to do is wait it out, right? But uh, so it's interesting that nobody in Rome had heard any of these accusations against him, but they had heard of Christianity. And they had heard that Christianity was being opposed on every front and everywhere they speak against it, right? And so they want to hear about it. And so as we read in verse 23, they they make an appointment, they choose a day, and then many of them come to his house. And so it says, uh, he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And if you've listened to the preachers for very long, you understand that most of them are capable of talking about the Lord Jesus Christ from morning till evening uh, and ever and ever. Uh, but he's worth talking about. And I know that this isn't hugely exciting, uh, and my, my demeanor isn't overly enthusiastic, but uh, he changes lives, and he makes the worthless priceless. And he takes the unrepairable and perfects it. So he's, he's pretty exciting, and he's worth talking about. I remember I was talking to Brother Sims, and I was all excited, and, you know, talking about how wonderful the Lord was. I said, so I just don't understand how people aren't, just don't get more excited about it. And I said it in like exactly that tone. And he says, yes, John, and you say it as if, you know, you're just discussing the weather. Like, no, no, this is me excited. You don't understand. But, you know, so it's, it's kind of funny. Anyway, so we can look at this, and he's expounding and testifying uh, on the kingdom of God. Expounding uh, suggests explaining things in detail or, or clarifying or even revealing. And testifying, of course, is, is bearing witness. It's, it's giving your own personal uh, narrative of what happened. It's your, your, you're affirming the truth based on your personal experience. And so Paul uh, not only explains the kingdom of God in detail, and you can see that the Lord did that, right? Over and over again, it says the kingdom of God is like unto such and such. The kingdom of God is like this. And Paul is going ahead here. And he's expounding this. He's declaring it. He's explaining it in detail. And in addition, he's providing his own testimony, his own personal experience, which confirms that what he is uh, declaring and explaining is true. And, I mean, we can get really semantic on it, but I'm going to skip about four paragraphs, and we're just going to leave it at that. But basically, the, the idea here is that Paul is, is reaching his demographic intellectually and emotionally. He's not just going through and telling you about how, you know, about who the Lord is. He's also explaining his experience with the Lord and that life-changing, that life-transforming, uh, that empowering uh, act that giving his heart to the Lord uh, brought and that comes from, I used, to, I used to stand there yelling, yeah, stone him. And then the Lord switched it over to now, you know, I'm proclaiming his, his truth uh, among the very ones I used to imprison. 
And so he's, he's giving this kind of a, a comprehensive approach, not just the logical, systematic, uh, scriptural explanation, but he's also bringing in his own personal testimony. And I think that's something important for us to remember because especially when we spend a lot of time in, in biblical exposition and a lot of time in intellectual exercise, we forget to make it real by, by speaking out of our personal experience. Uh, more of this world than not cannot be reached through their intellect they need to be reached through the realness of a person's experience. I once went to a seminar to learn how to uh, do a certain thing, and the person spent the entire class telling us how this, these classes had been successful here and there and, and how it changed lives, and I, I didn't care because I was already convinced that the class was a good thing to do. I just wanted to know how to do it. And so I'm like, all right, talk to my brain, you know, not to my emotions, and, uh, but, you know, they come from a part of the world where people don't think with their brains, they think with their emotions, and so that's how you get, that's how you make the sale, is through personal experience, and so I would encourage you, as you go about uh, your day-to-day -day life, and you talk with people, your experience touches them more than a logical explanation of what the scripture means. If they don't see it real in your life, no amount of argument or no amount of logic is going to influence them. So you have to give them your experience, but then you have to bring it back and ground it in the scripture. Because emotions can go crazy and you can feel all kinds of things, and so you need to ground your experience in the word of God. <coughs> and then... Uh, we read that he was persuading them concerning Jesus through the law and the prophets. And here, um, Paul is connecting this, this hope of Israel, is connecting Jesus Christ as the hope of Israel through the law of Moses and through the, through the Old Testament, basically. And this is, this is fitting because, remember, the Lord said... Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Which means, by implication, they were talking about him. He's the fulfillment of the law. He's the fulfillment of the prophet. He then says, uh, that was uh, what, Matthew 5, 17. He says in Luke 24, 27, uh, that he began at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scripture the things concerning himself. And then in John 5, 46, he's recorded as saying, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So we see that Paul is, is carrying along the same lines that Jesus Christ himself used to discuss his status as the Messiah, as uh, the incarnate God. Uh, speaking about, the, you know, Moses talked about me, the, the prophet spoke about me. In fact, the whole purpose of the Old Testament is to lay the groundwork for the New Testament. And, that's not, and that doesn't diminish the Old Testament in any way. Uh, but the Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law. He is the fulfillment of the prophets. And so we look at this word persuade. It means to convince or to win over uh, and so, you know, again, it's more than just convincing somebody of an intellectual fact. It's a convincing them in their heart so that they will take life-changing action. And, of course, he did that from morning till evening. And then we read in 24 that some believed the things which were spoken and some didn't. And then they couldn't agree amongst themselves, and so they left. But before they left, Paul it says he had spoken one word, and that doesn't mean that he just said a single word, you know, but it means like a word as like, I've got a word of the Lord for you. And so he quotes Isaiah, you know, go into this people and say, hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are full of hearing, and their ears have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and should be converted, and I should heal them. And so Paul is, is using this verse to say, hey, you are, right now, you are fulfilling this old, uh, this, 
uh, prophecy of Isaiah's. And then he says, as a result, or be it known therefore unto you, that means as a result, understand this, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And so, and then when he said that, the Jews left and had, you know, quote, great reasoning amongst themselves. And so it's, we see over and over again that no matter how persuasive the minister of God is, some people just reject it. No matter how wonderfully I preach, somebody's going to fall asleep. But uh, so how some of the Jews uh, rejected him, some of them believed, and so this is again, uh, it cons- you know, this carries on that consistent theme of the Lord telling them, the Jews have rejected me, bring this on to the Gentiles. And uh, we'll notice Jesus used this same prophecy talking to uh, the people in Mark 4.12, it says that you quotes that same scripture, saying they may see and not perceive, hearing they may hear and not understand. Blessed any time they should be converted. And so when we look at this scripture, it's, it's interesting to look at. Uh, and uh, one of these days we're going to start go- doing a study where we look at every time the Lord Jesus Christ quotes the scripture and then the context of it, because that'll take about a decade and that'll be most informative. But... What Isaiah is is telling the people is, look, your hearts have turned away from God, and you've lost that sensitivity to uh, to his call, and then you've deliberately closed your ears. You've deliberately closed off your, closed your eyes, I mean, and deliberately closed off your ears so that you won't hear, you won't see the truth, and that you won't understand it. Because if you saw it, if you heard it, and if you understood it, you would respond to it, and you would receive the salvation that the Lord is, is offering you. And so it's not like uh, they are inadvertently deaf, dumb, and blind to this, and inadvertently missing out on what the Lord is giving, or that the Lord is taking it away from them. What he's saying is, you have deliberately rejected me. And in rejecting me, you have made it entirely impossible for you to receive the salvation which I have so freely given to all. And if you did understand, you would respond, you would be converted, and you would be healed. But you will not uh, understand because you choose not to see and you choose not to hear. You understand this isn't about somebody just, just accidentally missing out on salvation. Nobody is going to accidentally miss out on salvation. Each and every person who goes to hell will do so because they have chosen to reject the Lord Jesus Christ deliberately. And so this is that saying, he's like, some of you don't believe, but I've explained it. I've given my witness. It was enough for half, you know, all these other people. But you are deliberately blinding yourself to the truth, deliberately closing your ears to the call, and deliberately not understanding And as a result, salvation is going to be uh, shared with the Gentiles. And after he said these words, the Jews departed, and there was great uh, reasoning amongst themselves. And it's so interesting to see the difference between the Jews in Rome and the Jews in Jerusalem, right? Because when he said that to the Jews in Jerusalem, you know, that God told me to depart from you and go to the Gentiles, they went crazy, and this man is not fit to live. But he tells these Jews, the disbelieving Jews, he tells them to your fate, to their face, you are fulfilling this prophecy of Isaiah's. And so we don't hear they get irate. We don't hear they try to kill him. They just go off and continue their conversation. And in one way, that's good. I mean, in, in many ways, that's good, Right? But one of the things that tells me about them as a people is they may have become too complacent with exploring ideas and not having that heartfelt relationship with God. You know, there's a time when you can abstract your religion into a set of intellectual uh, principles and you lose the reality of God. 
you lose the reality of his power and his purpose in your life. And I would feel a little bit better if I saw that the Jews were upset at this and strove with him, meaning they were arguing with him. Well, what about this? Well, what about that? You know, uh, and exp exploring it. But they go off to debate and to discuss. And yes, we're glad that they didn't try to kill him. Um, and the interesting thing is, of course, we're not told anything more about the Jewish community there in Rome. Uh, we, we're not told how many of them converted to Christianity. We're not told if any of them uh, tried to defend Christianity. Uh, they just go off into non-existence as far as the Scripture seems to care. And then we go into Acts 28, 31, or 30 and 31, the last two verses, finally. Let's take a moment to savor this. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. And so he had called the elders of the Jews together to tell them about the Lord. Some believed, some didn't. And then for the next two years, he had his own hired house. He was not supported by, by the government. I, I'm going to just say this then. Uh, Paul is living in his own house in Rome. He's, he's supported. Uh, some of the churches give him, you know, aid to help him, you know, live there. But he was not paid for by the government. He wasn't subsidized by the government. When the government started subsidizing preachers and prophets, when the government started getting involved in funding religion, that's when everything tanked. That's when Christianity stopped being a force for good and, and Christians stopped being oppressed and people proclaiming themselves to be Christians started oppressing others. And we see them going from victims to perpetrators. It's always dangerous to be paid for by somebody else. The one who pays for the house ultimately controls the message. So, keep that in mind. And then, of course, he received all that came in unto him. The assumption there is that it's many Gentiles in addition to, to uh, Jewish citizens. And then he says, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. All right, so the, again, we had seen expounding and testifying and persuading and now we see preaching and teaching, right? So God, uh, Paul had first spoken to the people who knew the law and who knew the prophets, and he used the law and the prophets to reveal the kingdom of God to them. He then gave his own testimony to validate the, his exposition and to persuade them, or then persuaded them that Jesus Christ was the promised Messiah the fulfillment of the law and the fulfillment of the prophets and the hope of Israel. And now, later, you know, later on in this, presumably to the Gentiles, uh, he pro first proclaims the kingdom of God. That's different, you understand, than just expounding on the law and the prophets. What he's doing is telling people, hey, the kingdom of God is here. Preaching is different from, from, uh, from teaching and uh, expounding. And so he's preaching the kingdom of God, and then he starts to teach those who believe uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, again, we're not going to get too deep into semantics because we're trying to cover all of this. And then finally, it says, with all confidence, right? He's doing this with all confidence, no man forbidding him. With all confidence literally reads, entire boldness and so it's not just that he's confident it's it's he's preaching this boldly uh, and then it says no man forbidding him is literally it's one word and it means unhindered so think about this for a minute because he's here in rome the center of paganism the seat of power the seat of evil right he's a prisoner of nero who is one of the worst and most depraved of the Caesars, who none of them were great. 
He was chained to a guard. His future was in doubt, and yet he preached the Lord Jesus Christ with entire boldness, completely unhindered. One would think that a chain would be hindering. So if there's ever a clear example of God's absolute indifference to the efforts of humanity to restrict him, this is one. If there was an example of anyone finding liberty in Christ regardless of circumstance, this is it. So bound by a chain to a guard, not an issue to Paul. He received visitors and he proclaimed the truth unhindered. Under house arrest, no problem. God doesn't accept limitations on his exercising of his power. And Paul was able to be unhindered. Uh, And one wonders if part of the reason he was not hindered is because the guard was not going to uh, refuse to stop him. Because perhaps the guard had heard enough and had been one of those who had been persuaded. We're not told. But the point here is that human chains will never hinder the word of God. And in fact, we see that human chains delivered the word of God exactly where God intended it to be delivered, regardless of the best efforts of mankind, despite the storms, despite the snakes, despite the threats of ambush, the Lord Jesus Christ used chains to deliver Paul exactly to where he wanted him to proclaim the gospel and to greatly bless the church in Rome. That was Acts. And going forward, we've got a few more topics to discuss out of the book of Acts, but that's the end of our exposition verse by verse, and I feel like maybe we should take a vacation because that was years of going through Acts. But it's amazing, isn't it, just how much is to be found in a simple narrative? Of all the things that Jesus taught and began to do, Acts has shown us that the Lord Jesus Christ has never stopped his working here in this world. That humanity's best efforts to stop him have done nothing but increase the uh, proclamation of the word of the Lord. Their attempts to stamp out the fire only spread the fire. Because God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And only God can have somebody in chains preach the word with complete boldness, completely unhindered. Praise the Lord. I'll try to figure out a way to preach that next time, and then we can have a good Sunday, Sunday service out of that. That was the word of the Lord. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Why don't we stand? Brother Tryon, would you pray our dismissal, please?